Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, you might recall back in chapter 10, verse 38, the author said that the just shall live by faith. So those who are justified or made righteous are done so by faith, which sets the stage for chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews, the Faith Hall of Fame, where the author talks about and deals with the issue of faith. Now, you recall we've divided chapter 11 into two, <coughs> excuse me, two very simple parts. Uh, the first part deals with the explanation of faith in verses 1 through 3, uh, where the author pointed out four things to explain to us the nature of faith. Now, the second section deals with examples of faith. That's in verses 4 through 40. And last time we were together, we looked at three examples of those who lived by faith. It involved Abel, who offered by faith. It involved Enoch, who walked by faith. And it involved Noah, who obeyed by faith. <coughs> Excuse me, <coughs> one second. What are you guys doing over there? For 20 years, you've been on this side of the aisle. <coughs> Boy, you messed me up today. <laughs> 20 years. Wow. And now you're changing seats. Mm. So, so <laughs> it's okay, Steve, Karen, you're all right on that side. <clears throat> I don't know how I'm going to function, but. <clears throat> so we had the explanation of faith and we have examples of faith. This, of course, brings us to verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 11 as we continue to look at some more examples of those who live by faith. So let's pick up our reading in verse 8, and we'll read down through verse 22 in our study today. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations and whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised." Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly they are seeking a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, which, from which he also uh, received him in a figurative sense. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instruction concerning his bones. Now, for you note takers, you outliners, uh, today we'll simply be looking at five more examples of faith, five more people who lived a life of faith. Number one, the first person is Abraham. Abraham, in verses 8 through 19. Now, we would mention two things about Abraham as it pertains to faith. The first thing 
involves the fact that Abraham obeyed by faith. Abraham obeyed by faith. That's in verses 8 through 10, and again, down in verses 17 through 19. Uh, Take a look at verse 8, if you would, please. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Now, stop right there for just a moment, because the author now switches gears from Abel, Enoch, and Noah, who were all very good examples of faith, to Abraham, no doubt the best example of one who walked by faith for the nation of Israel, for the Jews specifically, because typically the Jews believed that Abraham was made righteous by his works, not by his faith. So the author clarifies this idea, and he's going to point out very clearly that Abraham was not made righteous by what he did, but in whom he believed. He was made righteous by his faith. Therefore, as he lists the descendants of Abraham or the sons of Abraham, as we'll see in just a moment, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, he points to these patriarchs as well as those who live by faith, inferring that if you are a son of Abraham, you need to understand that you're made righteous not by good works, but by faith. In fact, Paul picked up on that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, when he says, only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Now, in verses 8 through 10, we see that Abraham obeyed by faith in four areas. There are four areas by which Abraham obeyed by faith. Let's take a look at them individually. Number one, first of all, we see Abraham's obedience by faith in light of his calling. His calling. Uh, Let's just read verse 8 again. In Hebrews 11, 8, it says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place of which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So the first area we see Abraham's obedience by faith involves his calling. And this, of course, points us back to Genesis chapter 12, when Abram, whose name would subsequently be changed to Abraham, it went from exalted father to a father of a multitude. Interestingly enough, he had no children at that point. Uh, But be that as it may, He was in the Ur of the Chaldees, where the Tigris and the Euphrates come together at the Persian Gulf. Many of you are familiar with that area. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God said, Abraham, he said, here I am, Lord, leave your country, your kindred, your father's house, and go to a land I will show you. Now, Abraham had no idea where he was going. But by faith, he left anyway. He walked by faith. Now, I hate that. I would just as soon know exactly where I'm going. I'd like to know how long it's going to take to get there and how many restaurants are on the way. But God doesn't always work that way, does he? I remember many, many years ago when the church was just starting, Sally and I recognized the calling that God put on our heart. We realized that God called us to serve Him. And as the church was starting, there were so many things going on, so many different paths to take, so many different things to do. And it it was a little overwhelming. And Sally was talking to Pastor Romaine. You guys remember Pastor Romaine at Calvary Costa Mesa, Pastor Chuck Smith's assistant pastor, the sweetest, most gentle, quietest. (laughs) Hey, we have to talk nice about him. He's dead. (laughs) He was a drill sergeant in the Marines his whole life. And that just gives you a little flavor of what this guy was like. Uh, He loved Sally, by the way. He just adored her. He hated me. I I remember the first time I met him, he looked up and he said, you're big and ugly. (laughs) Okay, I get that a lot. Uh, (laughs) But he adored Sally and and she was talking to him. Oh, Pastor Romaine, you know, the church is starting and there's so many things going on. And, you know, what about this? And how about this and this? And people were coming to get, oh, it was just a crazy time. And and he said, what do you, what do you want? A little shoebox with a map inside with a little bow tied on it to tell you exactly what to do and where to go? (laughs) 
well, yeah, <laughs> it's exactly what we want. But you know, God doesn't work that way, does he? Oftentimes when God stirs our heart, when God calls us to do something, whether it's to serve him with our family, to serve him on our jobs, to serve him at our churches, wherever it may be, oftentimes we don't get the full picture. God just says, here's what I want you to do. Well, okay, God, how do you want me to do it? When do you want me to do it? Where do you want me to do it at? Oftentimes you're just saying, here's what I want you to do. So, so what does that mean for us? Well, it means we need to walk by faith. It's exactly why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we're to walk by faith, not by sight. Yeah. So the first way we see Abraham's obedience as it pertains to his faith it involves his calling. Number two, the second thing involves his sojourn or his journey. Look at verse 9. It says, by faith, he sojourned or journeyed in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now, Abraham understood that he was a sojourner. He was a pilgrim. In fact, at the very end of verse 13, it says they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So even though he was promised the promised land, the land of Canaan, he still lived his life as a nomad, as a pilgrim living in tents. Why? Well, because he recognized and realized that it wasn't about where he was at. It's going to ultimately about where he's going to go, which is heaven. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. But Abraham believed that he was a pilgrim. He understood that his life on earth was just a journey. And friends, so too it is with us. Look, we're just passing through. This life we live is short. James 4.14 says our life's a vapor. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. Now, first service understood that principle very well. Okay, a lot of us in first service are, are getting really old and we're close to the end. Now, not so much for you in second service. You're all young and, and spry and, and beautiful and handsome and smart, and, and I hate you. <laughs> and then there's the rest of us who realize that, boy, time is short. So we need to recognize that we're just pilgrims. We're just passing through. Jesus highlights this in his high priestly prayer, by the way, in John chapter 17. He says, even though we're in this world, the inference is we're not of this world. And therefore, he lived his life by faith as it pertains to his sojourn or his journey on earth. Number three, the third way we see Abraham's obedience by faith involves his patience. His patience. Look at verse 10. It says, speaking of Abraham, he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So here we see his patience. Now, Abraham, of course, lived in the land of Canaan, yet he never fully possessed the totality of the land of Canaan. There was always the various ites that were living in it, the Canaanites, the, 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 the parasites, the, the Philip pillophites, I mean, all of the fights. All of the ites were dwelling there still. And so he never fully received the land, we might say. However, he was patient because he recognized that he was not looking for an earthly city, but he was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. In fact, drop down to verse 14 for just a moment. This is highlighted for us. In verse 14, it says, For those who say such things declare plainly they are seeking a homeland or a final destination. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out of, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they are desiring a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God, not a city in the promised land, so to speak. You say, okay, Clark, I get it. But what does that mean to me? Well, I think the application becomes very powerful. Why 
Well, because Abraham was not looking to the temporal, he was looking to the eternal. He wasn't looking to the city on earth. He was looking to the city in heaven, if you will. And boy, what a great example that sets for us. Because as we just learned in the previous section, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. Therefore, our attention needs not be on the temporal, but on the eternal. You know, Paul tells, tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, he says, do not look at the things that are seen, but rather look at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but rather look at the things that are not seen, for the things that are not seen are eternal. We call it keeping that eternal perspective, keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ, staying focused on Him, because that is ultimately where we're going to spend eternity. So the third aspect of Abraham's obeying by faith involves his patience. And number four, and this one's pretty heavy, it involves his offering. His offering. Look at verse 17. Drop down to verse 17. In verse 17, it says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now, this, of course, brings us back to Genesis chapter 21. Because in Genesis chapter 21, Abraham finally had a son. Remember, God promised Abraham and Sarah a son, a son of promise. But in Genesis chapter 21, verse 5, we're told that Abraham was 100 years old when his son was finally born. Could you imagine waiting patiently all that time for God's promise to come true? And finally, the son of promise... Isaac is born, Itzhak. But then immediately in Genesis chapter 22, God spoke to Abram. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt sacrifice on a mountain that I will show you. Abraham, you've waited a hundred years for the birth of your child, and here he is. He is the most precious thing in your sight. This is who you love the most. But I want you to take him and sacrifice him, offer him on a mountain that I will show you. And by faith, Abraham woke up early the next morning. He didn't question God. He didn't go against God. He was obedient to God in his offering. He made that three-day journey from Beersheba to Mount Moriah, to what we call the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem. And his son Isaac said, Father, he said, here I am, my son. Here is the wood and the fire and the knife, but where is the sacrifice? <sighs> Could you imagine? And Abraham said something amazing. He said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. God would provide himself a, a sacrifice. Speaking of sacrificing his son. But Abraham was obedient. He tied up his son and he raised the knife. You all know the story. Can you imagine? Now I have two sons. And there were times that I wish <laughs> I had heard this command. <laughs> However, I'm not sure I would have had enough faith to actually go through with it. You know what I'm saying? But Abraham did. He raised the knife. And an angel appeared and said, touch not the lad. And there was a ram stuck in the thicket. Not a lamb, but a ram. So he sacrificed the ram because the lamb would come 2,000 years later. When God would provide himself a sacrifice. Why was Abraham willing to sacrifice his own son? Because according to verse 19, 
he, was, he believed that God could even raise him from the dead. That's faith. Back to Hebrews chapter 11. We said there were two things about Abraham as it pertains to his faith. Number one, we saw Abraham obeyed by faith. But number two, and real quickly, we see that Abraham lived by faith. Abraham lived by faith. That's in verses 12 through 16. And we would mention two things about Abraham living by faith. Number one, it involves the promise of a people. The promise of a people. Look at verse 12. In Hebrews 11, verse 12, it says, Therefore, from one man, from Abraham, and him as good as dead, he was a hundred years old, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the sea. Now, in Genesis 12, 2, God said he would make Abram a great nation. In Genesis 15, in Genesis 17, God said his descendants would be like the stars in the sky, like the sand by the sea. And while Abraham never physically saw the fulfillment of this promise, he lived his life as though it had already happened. So Abraham lived his life in light of, number one, the promise of a people. But there's a second thing involved here, and that involves the promise of a place. The promise of a place. Look at verse 13. In verse 13 of Hebrews 11, it says, These all died in faith, not re having received the promises, but having seen them far off, they were assured of them, they knew they would happen, and they embraced them as though they already did happen and confess they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly, if, if they had uh, called to mind that country from which they had come out of, they would have had an opportunity to return. In other words, if they thought about the past, they'd go back home. But they were living by faith, because according to verse 16, they desired a better place, a heavenly country. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. So Abraham lived by faith. It involved the promise of a people, and it involved the promise of a place. Did Abraham receive the promise of the place physically? The answer is no. He never received the whole land of Canaan. Did he receive the promise of a place spiritually? Absolutely. He went to heaven, to a city whose maker and builder is God. In other words, he kept that eternal perspective. And I think the point here is pretty simple. Like Abraham, we too need to live our lives as though we fully have embraced God's promises and they've already happened, and we can see them manifested even though they haven't. That is living by faith. Back to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's come to the second example. We said there were five. We've looked at Abraham. Now, the second example is Sarah in verse 11. Sarah. And here we see that Sarah was strengthened by faith. If Abraham obeyed by faith and lived by faith, Sarah was strengthened by faith. Take a look at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 11. It says, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age, past the age of child, child bearing. Why? Well, because she judged him, God, faithful, who had promised. Now, back in Genesis 17, God promised Abraham and Sarah a son. He is referred to as the son of promise. And then in Genesis chapter 18, when Abraham and Sarah were in their tent, uh, there at the terebinth trees of Mamre, three men approached them. You remember that story? One was the Lord. And it was the Lord who said in Genesis chapter 18, I shall return to you again in the time of life. In other words, I'm here today and I'll be back in nine months at the time of life when Sarah shall bear a child. And that's what he told Abraham. Now, Sarah overheard what the angel or what the Lord said to Abraham. And she, of course, laughed. That's why they called his name Itzhak or laughter. Because she laughed when she heard she was going to have a child. Because when she heard it, she was 89 years old. Now, she laughed 
I'd cry. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's kind of a bizarre reaction to me, laughing. I would say, no way. A child at 89, I told Sally the other day, we're not having any more kids. <laughs> <laughs> and she laughed, and in Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, the Lord said, is there anything too hard for God? Wow. Is there anything too hard for God? Absolutely not. Yeah, but Clark, she's 89 years old. Come on. I mean, a child, really? Oh, yes. See, this is faith. Faith is believing that God can do something that it goes against nature itself. Can God do something bigger than that in the natural realm? The answer, of course, is yes. God can do everything. There's nothing too hard for God. Well, can God make a rock so big he can't move it? That's stupid. <laughs> I don't know where people come up with this nonsense. But the answer is there's nothing too hard for God. Now, just because in our feeble little mind we can't fully comprehend what's all involved in that doesn't mean, it, doesn't mean it's any less true. So Sarah received strength to bear a child. Why? Well, according to the end of verse 11, because she judged him, she judged God to be faithful who had given her that promise. Will God's promises come true? That was a question. <laughs> yes, of course they will. When? I don't know. How? I'm not sure. And quite frankly, I don't even care. Because I know God's promises one day will come to fruition. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says all of God's promises in Him are yes and amen. It's going to happen. Why are God's promises always going to happen? Well, because God is faithful. In fact, according to Hebrews chapter 10, at the end of verse 23, the Bible says, He who promised is faithful. Question, is God always faithful? Oh, yes, absolutely. Does God's faithfulness depend on me? Absolutely not. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.13, the Bible says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And that if is in the first class condition, by the way, we would say, since we are faithless, God remains faithful. Now, that, of course, does not give us a license to be faithless. Don't misunderstand. It doesn't mean we can just do whatever we want to do and say, well, God's going to do it, do it in spite of me. So why not just, hey, are you kidding me? No, God wants us to be faithful. There's no doubt about that. But even when we slip and fall once in a while, even when we falter in our faith, please don't think that somehow God's not going to be faithful because of us. No, He's always going to be faithful to uphold His promises. And when we understand that, listen, gang, when we fully grab a hold of that, we, like Sarah, will be strengthened. We're going to receive strength to go through something, we think there is no possible way I can go through it. Lord, there is no way I can give birth at 89 years old. There's no way I'll make it through the delivery process. You follow me? Follow me? Impossible. Oh, not for God. And that's about the life of faith that God has blessed us to be able to live with. Well, let's come to the third example. We have to hurry. The third example is Isaac. Isaac. We've looked at Abraham. We've looked at Sarah, his wife. Now Isaac, their child. And in verse 20, we see Isaac blessed by faith. Isaac blessed by faith. Take a look at verse 20. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20, it says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, his two sons, concerning things to come. Now, Isaac, interestingly enough, lived longer than any of the other patriarchs, 180 years old. But we have very little mentioned about him in Scripture. We know in Genesis 26 that there was a famine in the land. So Isaac and Rebekah went to Gear uh, to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, and lived there for quite a while and grew and became uh, quite uh, wealthy, if you will. And interestingly enough, he had a lapse of faith there in Gerar. 
because his wife, Rebecca, was beautiful to behold, the Bible says. And when they asked, who is this woman? He said, it's my sister, not my wife. He thought they would kill him and take his wife. So he said he's his sister. But King Abimelech saw them embracing one day. And he said, look, clearly this is not your sister or, I mean, something crazy going on here. Uh, clearly she's your wife. And he fessed up. And Abimelech got a word from God not to harm him. And he didn't. But in Genesis chapter 27, Isaac is very old at this point. His eyes are dim, the Bible says. And he calls his oldest son Esau to receive the blessing. But Rebekah hears it. You remember the story? And Rebekah went to her other son, Jacob, and said, look, Jacob, your father is going to bless your brother because he's out hunting for some venison, some, some deer meat. So I'll tell you what. I want you to go to the corral, get a couple of goats. I'll make some savory food the way he likes it. And you go to him and pretend to be Esau so you can receive the blessing. And Jacob said, well, you know, Mama, I don't think that's such a great idea because I'm a smooth-skinned man, and, well, Esau, he's a hairy man of the field. And his mom goes, well, here's the goat meat. I'll take the skin of the goat and put it on your hands and on the back of your neck so when your father holds you, he'll think you're Esau. Now, that tells me a little something about Esau, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, this was, I mean, his hair was like goats. This guy needed to trim up a little bit, apparently. <laughs> I mean, his hair was like goat skin. But really tells me something about his wife, too, Rebecca. I mean, she made goat meat like venison. Anyway, she's quite the cook. But, but, the, but, but the point is, Isaac waffled in his faith his whole life, right up until his death, if you will. But in Genesis chapter 28, verses 3 and 4, he finally blessed Jacob with the blessing of Abraham. Even though Jacob stole the blessing by pretending to be his brother Esau, Isaac came to his senses and, and, and subsequently blessed Jacob. And I think the point for us is pretty simple. Like Isaac, we all waver in our faith. We might not get it right the first few times. Uh, but like Isaac, there's hope. I mean, there's hope for all of us. That even right to the end, God can touch our hearts as we live by faith. Number four, real quickly. Let's come to the fourth person that we're given by way of an example of faith, and that's Jacob. And in verse 21, we see that Jacob blessed by faith, just like his father Isaac. Look at verse 21. It says, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. That would be Ephraim and Manasseh and worship leaning on the top of his staff. Now, Jacob, like his father, father Isaac, stumbled in his faith quite often. You can read all about it from Genesis chapter 28. But in the end, he too realized that the blessing would go to the younger son, Joseph, as well as his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, in Genesis chapter 48, Joseph comes to Jacob. Jacob is old. His eyes are dim. Joseph sets his two sons before the grandfather for the blessing. But Jacob crosses his hands over. He puts his right hand on Ephraim, the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh, the older. And Jacob, um, or excuse me, and Joseph tries to stop him. He says, Father, Father. You crossed your hand. You're giving the blessing to the younger son, not the older. And he said, I know. The blessing shall go to the younger son. And it went to Ephraim. Now, the moral of this story, the application for us is powerful. Because Jacob went against the cultural norm at the time. Culturally speaking... It was inappropriate to give the blessing to the younger, not the older. <laughs> but that was God's plan all along, that the blessing would go to the younger, not the older. And I think the point for us is pretty simple. It doesn't matter what's culturally correct. It doesn't matter what man says. The question is, what does God say? 
What does the Bible teach? Look, a lot of people today, they don't want to be culturally incorrect. <laughs> I'd rather be biblically correct and culturally incorrect. You know what I'm saying? The only thing that matters is what does God say? Because what man thinks changes with time. For years, man thought this way, and then many years later, man thinks a different way on, on just about every issue. But God never changes. His word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, number five and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. The fifth and final example is Joseph in verse 22. Joseph. And here we see that Joseph mentions leaving Egypt by faith. Joseph mentions leaving Egypt by faith. Look at verse 22. It says, by faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt after the 430 years of captivity and gave instructions concerning his bones. Now, the story of Joseph goes back to Genesis 37, when Joseph being the youngest of the brothers, until Benjamin, of course, was born. He was the youngest, Benjamin. But Joseph being the youngest at that time, before the birth of uh, Benjamin, was treated well by his father. He was given the robe of many colors. He was given to be the overseer of his brothers who tended the flock. And in Genesis chapter 37, when Joseph came to his brothers in Dotham, which means two cisterns, they said, oh, here comes that dreamer. Here comes the one with that robe of many colors. I'll tell you what, let's kill that kid. And Reuben said, no, no, he's our brother. We can't kill him. Let's just throw him in this ditch. Like, okay, uh, we'll just let him die a slow, painful death in a ditch, then just killing him quickly. I never understood that. But the point is, they didn't kill him. And subsequently, some Midianite traders came by and sold him into slavery. He, they took him to Egypt. He subsequently was sold to the house of Potiphar to be a slave in the house of uh, the head of the prison. Potiphar's wife, Mrs. Potiphar, accused him of, of coming on to her. He subsequently was thrown in prison. He was released eventually and became second to Pharaoh. You all know the story. And in Genesis chapter 42... We're told that Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to buy grain because of the famine. And subsequently, in Genesis 45, Joseph couldn't take it anymore. And he revealed himself to his brothers. He said, guys, I'm your brother. And it was a, a great reunion, if you will. And they all come from the land of Canaan down to Egypt, where Joseph is second in command. They all settle in the land of Goshen. And when... Joseph is ready to die in Genesis chapter 50, verse 25. By faith, at 110 years old, by faith, he says, when you leave Egypt, take my bones out of Egypt and bury me in the promised land with my fathers. So by faith, he made the declaration that they would indeed leave Egypt. Now, it wouldn't happen for 430 years, but eventually it came true. And I think the point here is all three of these men were on their deathbeds. All three of these men never really received the promises of God to, in its totality. And all three of these men passed the promise of God to their children by faith. And I think for us, the application is very simple. We need to live our lives in such a way that it would seem to others that God's promises have already come true in our lives. That we've already seen God's promises being fulfilled in our lives, even though they haven't. Because that's faith. And we have faith in God's faithfulness to carry us for all of eternity in heaven. Why not have the same faith in the same God for today, for tomorrow? what's going, in our, going, in, uh, going on in our lives this week. Because it's all about simply faith in the Lord. Father, it's, it's a simple lesson that you've given us today, Lord, but a, but a very timely and very important lesson for all of us, I'm sure.
And Lord, we do pray that by your spirit, you would help each and every one of us to be those who walk by faith, those who live by faith. Though we live our lives as though what you've promised has already happened, Lord. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, amen, amen. Shall we stand together? Next week, Lord willing, verse 23, read ahead. If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors and the brothers and the sisters, they'll be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you. Don't forget, uh, next Sunday after third service, there's going to be a picnic, barbecue, bring a side dish, bring a dessert. If you'd like to get baptized, uh, maybe re-baptized and recommit your life to the Lord, or maybe you'd like to get baptized with your spouse, maybe your entire family. Maybe they're old enough now where they understand water baptism. You like to do it all together next Sunday. Just bring a bathing suit and a towel. We've got the robes. We'll be right here in the baptismal. Uh, the water will be heated and nice. So uh, no matter what the weather is, it should be a glorious time. We're going to have uh, food, rock climbing, games for the kids. Should be a great time for a church picnic and barbecue and baptism. That's next Sunday after third service. So until then, may God richly bless you. May he open the windows of heaven and pour out his spirit upon you, strengthening your hearts, your hands, guiding your feet as you fall more in love with Jesus. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, have a great week in the Lord.